In this video, I'd like to show you how to implement digital filters which are based on analog prototypes. For example, a simple RC low pass filter. And I've currently got this uh, implementation running on this STM32 microcontroller on this little brain board which I had made by GLC PCB. I've got the code running which is filtering accelerometer data and then feeding that back through a virtual COM port on my computer. And here you can see the result. So the red line is the raw accelerometer data. As you can see, I'm moving the board and there's some high frequency noise on there. And I'm using a simple digital filter, which we'll design in this video. And that's the green trace you can see. And you see that's nicely low pass filtered. So let's get started. As usual, this video is sponsored by JLC PCB. And the PCBs you saw at the beginning were actually manufactured and assembled by them. And the cool thing is they actually assemble connectors now. So USB connectors, video connectors, and any type of connector you could think of. If you'd like to order these little brain boards, you can go to my GitHub repository, github.com slash PMS67, click on repositories, and then find the little brain sensor board. I've provided all of the assembly and Gerber files so you can try out the board, get it produced at JLC PCB. It's fairly inexpensive, only a couple of tens of dollars. And yeah, you can play around with the accelerometers, um, gyroscopes, the flash memory, and so forth. But yeah, so let's get back to the video. The channel just hit over 30,000 subscribers, which is really cool. So thank you all for your support. For the next video, I'd like to make a kind of question and answer video to celebrate the 30k subs. So I've made this little Q&A survey, which I'll link to in the description of this video, where you can enter any questions or comments or suggestions for future videos. In this video, I'd like to talk about real-time software implementation of analog filters. In essence, how do we take electronic analog filters as prototypes, model them mathematically, and then implement them in software on, for example, microcontrollers or DSPs? Here's an overview of what we'll be covering. In essence, this video is a precursor to the IIR filtering video, which is going to be coming out soon, which follows on the FIR filter video, which you can see on my channel. So we're going to look at simple passive filters, for example, RC filters or filters that are built up of passive components, such as resistors, capacitors, and inductors. We'll see how to analyze them, and then how to model them, and then also how to implement them in software. The reason we're doing this is because analog filters oftentimes have their own problems. For instance, they're complicated to design, they have component tolerances, they only have certain values, for example, the E-series values for resistors. Uh, inductors, for example, have uh, pretty strong nonlinearities, and in essence, once you've designed and built the filter, it's pretty much fixed. One solution is to actually emulate these filters using DSP in software. So we write these filters in code, which means we don't have any component tolerances, we can get rid of the nonlinearities, and we can change them quickly on the fly. Here are some of the digital filtering advantages. Of course, we're going to need some extra hardware, for example, analog to digital converters, the actual processor itself, and then a digital analog converter. The thing is, they're pretty easy to implement, these filters. They're very easy to change on the fly, for example, if you want to change the cutoff frequency or type of filter, and typically you can get away with a lower cost and a lower overhead for designing. Additionally, most processing is done in the digital domain nowadays anyway, so it's a pretty useful trick to know. Here are the three steps we need to do to go from an analog filter prototype to the digital domain. First of all, we have to model the analog filter mathematically, and that's typically done with differential equations. Then we need to discretize the filter, so we need to go from continuous time differential equations to discrete time difference equations. Then the third step is, once we have these difference equations in discrete time, the software implementation is actually really straightforward, and I'll show you how to do that soon. So let's start by looking at really basic passive building blocks, which we can use to model analog filters. As I said before, we're just gonna be looking at very simple types, consisting of resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Essentially, we use these building blocks and we can combine them together in clever ways and then analyze them using Kirchhoff's voltage and current laws to set up a differential equation. So we have, for example, the resistor on the left here, a capacitor in the middle, and the inductor on the right. And each of these has a voltage across it and a current relationship, which we can see described here. And that's all we need to then model these components and then in turn model the overall filter. As a really simple example, let's look at an RC low pass filter. And this is oftentimes seen in various designs, analog and digital. In essence, we have a resistor where we apply an input voltage, and on the other side of the resistor, we feed that into a capacitor and we take the voltage as an output from there. And this is a low pass filter. So essentially, this will attenuate higher frequency components while passing lower frequency components. To analyze this, we assume there's no load of the output, and the current through the resistor is the same as the current through the capacitor. Now, remembering the current relationships before, we can write up uh, an equation here. So the input minus the output voltage divided by the res resistance is the current through the resistor, and the capacitance times the rate of change of the voltage across it 
is also the current. And these two are equal. Now we can rearrange that and put V out on one side and V in on the other side. And this gives us a governing differential equation for the system, which relates the output to the input. Now this is all good, but we are still in the continuous time domain and we can't really implement this on a digital discrete time system. So we need to move from a differential equation, which is in continuous time, to a difference equation, which is in discrete time. So we want to start working on samples. And this is kind of shown here. So this is continuous time, and we want to essentially sample at fixed time intervals to go into uh, discrete time. And there's several methods of doing this. There's the forward Euler method, backward Euler method, Tustin, and so forth. For simplicity, and in this video, we're going to be using the backward Euler method. And this is really quick to do and really simple. However, if you want the best frequency domain match from the analog to the digital domain, I'd advise you to use the Tustin transformation. So this is what the backward Euler method actually looks like. And it is, in fact, incredibly simple. We expectedly need to approximate the continuous time derivative any time we see a dv by dt or d something by dt. We can approximate that by this equation on the right hand side here. So we take one sample, take away the previous sample, and divide it by t. And capital T is actually the sampling time in seconds of our digital discrete time system. And we can also do this for higher order derivatives, so d2v by dt squared and so on. And this is effectively just coming from a Taylor series. So let's try this out with our RC low pass filter. Remember we had derived a differential equation using Kirchhoff's voltage laws and the simple current voltage relationships for resistors and capacitors. And this is our differential equation. Now all we need to do is replace any time we see a V out or V in, we reply, replace it with a sampled version. So V out at the sample n or V in at the sample n. The derivative, we are using the backward Euler method where we simply replace the derivative by the approximation of the derivative at that sample. So v out n minus v out n minus 1 divided by the sample time t. And this, in fact, is our difference equation. Now we can rearrange that difference equation so we get the output of the filter is something times the input to the filter plus something times the previous output of the filter. And this is a really simple linear difference equation. So the output is dependent on the current input and the previous output sample. So it's kind of a recursive filter and this is actually known as an IIR filter. And I'll go into far more detail to this in an upcoming video. But effectively, this is all we need to then implement this in software. So it's really neat. All we need to know are these, the sampling time, the RC uh, constant, the current sample, we just store the previous sample, and then we can compute the next output sample. And this is how we can emulate or simulate this analog filter in software. Before we move over to actually implementing this on some proper hardware, here's some practical tips. In particular for the RC low pass filter, the cutoff frequency or the minus 3 dB point is actually given by this formula over here. So if you want a cutoff frequency of 10 Hertz, you can find out the RC constant by using this formula over here. Another point to note is that the sampling time needs to be sufficiently small to ensure an accurate match between the analog prototype filter and the digital uh, emulation or simulation of that filter. We also need to choose T, so the sampling time, to ensure an adequate Nyquist limit. So if we're sampling uh, at 100 Hertz, then we can only have uh, all process filter signals up to 50 Hertz. Additionally, when we move to the discrete time domain, we're going to need to be taking care of stability as well. IIR filters can sometimes become unstable, but in this case, we'll be fine. So let's move over to the actual software implementation. So in a previous few videos talking about STM32 firmware, FIR filter design and so on, we've expanded on this little brain firmware and you can find the current version in the GitHub repository and have a browse, feel free to have a browse through the code. We're going to add a bit to it today. So let's move over to the STM32 cube IDE. I've already made a header file for our RC filter, and this contains the RC filter struct, as well as two functions. One is to initialize the filter with the cutoff frequency and the sample time we'll be using, and then one function that'll actually perform the filtering. So take an input and give us a filtered output. And this is essentially just implementing this simple RC low pass filter. Of course, you can adapt this to fit other filters and your needs. Now the filter structure actually will contain uh, the filter coefficients, which we have two of them, and I'll show you those in a second, and the output buffer. So we remember we have to store the current output sample and the previous output sample. Now, if we look back at the RC filter difference equation, remember we have two coefficients, essentially. We have two constants. We have T over T plus RC, which is our first coefficient, and we have RC over T plus RC, which is our second coefficient. We can pre-compute them and save them in the filter struct, and that'll save us some computational time later on. Now here's the actual source file, and I've put in some comments and we're gonna fill in the code together. So here's the initialization function, 
where we compute, for example, from the cutoff frequency, the RC constant, and we also pre-compute the filter coefficients. And then we have the update function, where we have to shift the output samples, compute a new output sample, and then return that filtered output sample. So here we can see the slide for the practical tips. And remember, to go from the cutoff frequency to the RC constant, we need to use this formula. So that's what we need to implement first. And all we have to do is essentially create a float called RC, and that's just one over two pi times the cutoff frequency. And we'll use that then in our filter coefficient computations. Now the filter coefficients are simply just an, uh, an array of size two. And again, we are just following what's in the slides. So the first coefficient is t over t plus rc, second coefficient is rc over t plus rc. And you can see that's exactly what I've done here. And that's pretty much the initialization function of the filter done. We've pre-computed the coefficients we need. Now let's go over to the update function. Now looking back at our governing difference equation, this is what we always want to refer back to. We can see we need our output buffer, which contains the current output sample and the previous output sample, and we always need to shift them every time we do a computation. And then we essentially just do multiplications and additions to get the output. So that's exactly what we're going to do. First thing we need to do is shift the output samples. So we're setting essentially the current output sample is out zero, and we're moving that into out one. And that's the shifting done. The next part is actually computing the new output sample. And that's essentially just following the difference equation. So the current output is the first filter coefficient times the current input, plus the second filter coefficient times the previous output. The final thing left to do is to return the filtered output sample. And that is stored, of course, in out zero. Now I'm writing all of this quite explicitly. There are some things you can make easier or simplify or make a bit nicer. But just for the clarity's sake, I've written out this. And that's pretty much all we have to do. One more thing which we should do in our initialization function is actually clearing the output buffer. So making sure our output array is set to zero before we actually do any filtering updates. So now that we have all of our filtering functions written, it's time to return back to the main.c source code file and add everything in to make sure we can actually filter our accelerometer data. The first thing of course is to include our header file, rcfilter. Then we have to create our rcfilter struct. Then at the beginning of our main function, uh, we actually have to initialize the low pass filter. So I'm passing the struct by reference, then I'm saying a cutoff frequency of five hertz in this case, fairly, fairly arbitrarily, but of course below the Nyquist limit. And I'm actually sampling the accelerometer data to 100 hertz, which means our sample time is actually 10 milliseconds or 0 0.01 seconds. And I'm passing that to the initialization function, which will then pre-compute all the filter coefficients for me. Now, if you've seen my previous video on FIR filtering and just general firmware for STM32 microcontrollers, you will see that I'm actually acquiring the accelerometer data via DMA stream. And I have a callback for that over here. So if I'm actually receiving the accelerometer data via the DMA, I get this callback is triggered. Then I will filter the accelerometer data using our filter update routine, passing, for example, the x-axis of the accelerometer. And then I'm actually sending that out via the virtual COM port the raw data and the filtered data. Next thing to do is then upload it to our STM32 microcontroller on the little brain board using this debug button. And I will actually be using this serial oscilloscope, which I featured in a previous video. And this is a really useful tool to plot data coming from, for example, this serial port when it's comma, comma separated. And I'll show you that in just a second. So I've used the ST-Link to flash the firmware onto this STM32 microcontroller. You can see the firmware seems to be doing its thing. SM32 cube ID is running, and here I'm running the serial oscilloscope, and you can see as I move the accelerometer or the board in my left hand, you can see the two traces here. So the green trace is the filter trace using our simple RC low pass filter with a cutoff of five hertz, and the red trace is actually our raw accelerometer data. So if we go in a bit closer, you can see there's actually quite a lot of high frequency noise on that accelerometer data, and our really simple several line of code are doing a great job of filtering out that high frequency noise. So this is a great, really quick implementation of an analog filter prototype.